Um, I'm going to teach something today, and, and you know, as, as a pastor, my job is to always, no matter what I teach, you should leave with a great amount of faith in that. Uh, if I teach on marriage and relationship, I want you to, to leave out here knowing that your marriage can work no matter how rocky it's been. If I'm teaching on, on healing, I want you to know that God is a healer, and I want you to walk out with enough faith to, to, to when you pray to know that you are healed. And, and today, I want to I teach something today. I've taught it before in the past, and I just feel like God has, has ordained this time for me to bring this back around. And, and, and I was really, uh, I wasn't apologizing for it or any such thing, but the other day, I was really kind of wrestling with it, and Amy read the scripture that, that, you know, I've read, but sometimes when you read it in a different translation or hear it out of somebody else's mouth, it means something different, or it just kind of jumps out at you. Revelation chapter 22. If you got your Bible, let's go there. And I'm going to read it out of what they call the Passion Translation. And uh, this, this just kind of sums up the rest of the lesson. And so I'm going to read this, these scriptures to you. Revelation chapter 22, uh, verses 10 through 14 out of the Passion. And, when, and I, I want to tell you how I respond to this word. I was actually supposed to be home that day and studying from the house. And, and uh, I had a few errands to run. But usually Mondays, I, I try to spend some time. But when she got up that morning and read this word to me, I got up, I ran my errands, I came to the church and started writing some things that God, through the scripture, just deposited on my heart. It was just one of those things that just not just spoke instantly, but loudly in my spirit. And so we'll read this, this verse. And he said to me, don't keep secret the prophetic words of this book for the time is near. Let the evildoers be at their worst and the morally filthy continue in their depravity. Yet the righteous will still do what is right and the holy will still be holy. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Say quickly. He said, I bring my reward with me to repay everyone according to their works. I'm the Alpha and the Tav or the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the completion. Wonderfully blessed are those who wash their robes white so they can access the tree of life and enter the city of bliss by its open gates. And so, the, the, you know, I read a lot more than really what jumped out to me. Go back to verse 10. He says, and he said to me, don't let the secret don't keep secret the prophetic words of this book for the time is near. And I was, as, a, as a, a pastor and minister, I've, stud, I've spent a lot of time spending, uh, studying the end times and, and the book of Revelation and all the prophetic books and the scriptures. And I, I actually, somebody walked by my office the other day after I, I came to the office and I took out journals that I had used for, for, to, uh, during my study of this. And I have, I have like 30 journals lined up on the edge of my desk going through and pulling stuff out of them just because I, I want to be able to relay this word. And I said, God, what part of this do you want me to, to relay? And God gave me one specific thing that he wanted me to, to, to bring today. And so I'm going to bring this, but I, I want you to know, how many of you have ever noticed that when you read the Bible, let's just, just take Mary, for example. Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, is minding her own business, and an angel shows up. And what's the first thing the angel has to say? Fear not. Fear not. And how many accounts in the Word of God has an angel shown up, and the first thing he had to say was, whoa, calm down. Because I want to tell you, when it comes to, to, to reading the Bible, that's fine. I read. When it comes to, you know, going to church, that's fine. I like, I like being with other people. You know, but, but if an angel showed up, the first thing he's going to have to tell Philip is calm down. <laughs> and, and I just want to say this. Can you imagine being, you know, Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, the Bible says that in John, he breathed on his disciples. said, receive the Holy Ghost. Well, nothing happened for 50 days, but one day at dinner, they all just started talking funny. So much so that, that the response of the people who heard them speaking in tongues for the very first time, you know what their response was? They're drunk. It, what I'm saying is sometimes spiritual things are weird. Sometimes you read the things of God and you think, oh my God, that would, that would just freak me out. And so when I start talking about end times, I, I ha there's two types of people that sit out here. There's the people who really want to know, and I've seen you lean closer. And there's people like, where's the door? And so I want you to know that when, I, when I'm speaking about things today, they come directly out of the word. And I've, I've, I believe myself, Pastor Brian, and anybody who's ministered on the stage, we want, we want you to understand one thing, that the word of God is true from Genesis to Maps. 
We want you to understand that everything in the Word of God has a place. Uh, there it is full of uh, over 5,000 promises. I'm not going to sit down and count them. I just believe somebody who did. You know, but there are enough promises in there for every situation in life. And sometimes there's two or three promises for every situation. You know, but I want you to understand when we talk about the end of times, I'm not talking about throwing a, 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 a board over you and say the end is near. You know, y'all seen that in movies before. I've been to cities where I actually did say, see a man walking down with one of those sandwich boards on front and back says the end is near. Have y'all ever seen that before? Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny to see that. But you know, there, there's something in that message. There's something in that message. And if you stop to think about it, you know what? There, there was a beginning. In the beginning, God created. But there is also an ending. And you know, we will not get to cover any of the the ending today there's something in the middle i feel like god wanted me to bring but i want to i want to start off with with just one thing we call the the end times we we the the ending of the rent end times the rapture anybody uh really read about the rapture before are you have you been taught on i just want to say how versed everybody is on the rapture okay good so so i don't have a whole lot of explaining to do but the rapture is a time where and it is, comes from a latin word called harpazio which means to seize to snatch to carry away now one thing that a lot of believers they, they will get real skeptical about the word rapture because the word rapture is not in found in the bible now, how many of you believe in the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? That is a viable doctrine in the Bible. Do you know the word tr Trinity is not in the Bible? Here's another one for you. The word Bible is not in the Bible either. Okay, so everything needs a name. I, I don't want somebody just pointing to you and just you live a life of, hey, you, you know. You have a name, you have something to identify. So the word rapture, it, when, when we read these scriptures coming up, I want you to understand that the word rapture was selected because it best describes this whole scene of, of being uh, seized or snatched or carried away, however you want to do it. And the picture of rapture is this. Amy and I live, live in a neighborhood right here in town, and at certain seasons of the year, we have these two hawks that come, and they, they I think they're looking for our little doggy, but they sit on the umbrellas out by our pool, and, they, and I've got pictures of them, one on one side, of, uh, one on, uh, on one umbrella and one on the other, and what are they doing? They're looking for something to, to seize, to snatch and carry away. Now, you know, we have rabbits in our neighborhood, and I love it. I actually pulled a slat off my fence so the rabbits could come in my backyard because I love to watch them. And so, you know, I hate to think that one of them just, you know, one of those cute little bunny rabbits bouncing around, eating some grass, and all of a sudden, rock! <laughs> We actually have a neighbor who had two very tiny dogs, and uh, one of them got picked up by a hawk, and fortunately the hawk dropped him, but from a, such a high distance that it really injured the dog, and, and it sank talons into him and hurt the dog. But that dog did not go out saying, boy, I hope I get picked up by a hawk today. You know, it's, it, it's the idea of a total surprise. You don't see it coming. And so when we use the word rapture, I want you to understand that, that, that there is a, it is, it is a viable thing. It is going to happen. Even though you don't see the word rapture in the Bible, it is a very viable thing. And it is the picture of that hawk sitting off at a distance or that bird of prey uh, and all of a sudden coming down without any notice, any warning, seizing, snatching, and carrying away. Now, I want you to know that God's not going to seize and snatch and carry you away by digging talons into you, okay? It's just the old idea of being taken at one time. And so that's where the word rapture comes from. And uh, I want us to go and look at just one, one thing that I, I, when I started teaching in times, I, 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 wanted, I, I made this set of rules as I was teaching. And my number one rule uh, for end times is do not try to put a date on the end times. Look, I, I want to, let me just explain this. And I'll share a scripture with you here in just a moment. Matthew chapter, uh, let's see, Matthew chapter 24. Uh, just, just go there and we'll read it here in just a moment. Matthew 24 verse 36. I want you to know that I give you permission to do not give not one dime to any ministry who thinks it's their job to find a mathematical equation or uh, some hidden secret in the word that God has hidden within the scriptures to determine the date of a rapture. I give you permission to not listen to that at all. 
I give you permission to not, to not follow them, to not follow their Instagrams, not their tweets, don't buy their books, don't read their articles. I can tell you it is a waste of ministry time to try to figure out when Jesus is coming back. The best thing I can tell you about when he's coming back is be ready. Be prepared. Okay? Matthew, 30, Matthew 24, 36 says it's concerning that day and the exact hour. No one knows when it will arrive. Not even the angels of heaven. Who knows? Only the who? Only the Father. Only the Father. Only the Father. I believe this. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit nor Jesus knows the hour. And I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says to act, ask, seek, and knock. The door will be open to you. Seek, you will find. Ask, and it has to be given to you. By covenant right, anything that Jesus knows or has access to, he has to share it with us. So if Jesus knew he, and we asked him, he would have to tell us. Is everybody following me so far? Y'all just drinking all this information in, right? He says, no one knows except the Father only. For it will, but he does give us a picture, a picture, okay? I love pictures. The Greek language, the Hebrew was written out of information. You can take a one Hebrew letter and it has a meaning upon a meaning upon a meaning and all, it has a number that has a meaning, but the Greek language was was written to paint pictures. So when we read this, here's what he says. For it will be exactly like it was in the days of Noah, when the Son of Man appears. So think about this. How many of you, you familiar with the story of Noah, right? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, Noah built a big boat. And what was that boat for? For what? For the flood. Okay, so he built an ark, and the ark was supposed to be for the flood. Now, did God tell him when the flood was going to appear? So if, if, if people smarter than me have figured out that it took over 150 years for Noah to build the ark. They lived a lot longer than we did, okay? It took over 100 years, I'd say over 100 years to build the ark. But the Bible also says he was a preacher of righteousness. So Noah had two things going on. Number one, Noah would go out and he would build this boat. This preparation for a coming flood. Let me tell you how difficult this was to describe to people. Because up until the time of the flood, water never fell from the sky. The Bible says that every the water came up from the ground to water the earth. Water had not fallen. So when and, and so there Noah basically had to invent a word to describe water falling from the sky. And in our modern day, we would lock this guy up. So not only is he talking about a coming flood, he's building this obnoxious thing out in a, in a mountain area. That he's got these things against him, and when he's not building, he's telling people, there's a flood coming, better get ready. There's a flood coming. And so what am I trying to do today? I'm trying to tell you there's a flood coming. There's a rapture coming. And, and see, just as they didn't have a word for flood back then, I've had to go and describe and tell you what the word rapture meant. What do you mean, Noah, there's a flood? Well, what God told me, there's a flood coming. Water's going to fall from the sky. From the sky. Okay, Noah, come on. Noah, what you growing behind that boat? <laughs> What you've been smoking, though, I mean, every, the, every, everything comes to what are you doing wrong? You are crazy when this is preached and ministered. And so Noah had to come up with this word called flood to describe what God has shown him. But let me tell you this. The boat was big enough for every person who knew about the coming flood. The boat was big enough for everybody in his community to get on board. The only thing he did not know was when the rain was going to fall. But Jesus said this in John. He said, I go away to prepare a place for you. He said, I go away to prepare a place for you. Jesus has been preparing a place for us. But what is it? He didn't say, so when you die that you, you can have it. 
He says, I will come again to receive you to myself. I'm getting way ahead of myself. He says this, for it will be exactly like it was in the days of Noah when the son of man appears. But the, before the flood, people were living their lives. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were having children. They didn't realize the end was near until Noah entered the ark. Look, when, when the, the, the man was gone, it was too late. And I'm not trying to promote fear here. I'm not trying to give an altar call so you rush to the altar because you're afraid of a door closing. I want you to, I want you to be prepared for the rapture only because you love Jesus Christ. And you recognize a need for a Savior. And you recognize a need for forgiveness. And you recognize that, that there are pe people who are preaching righteousness, trying to prepare people for something that is about to come. You, here's the only word that Jesus gives about the timing of a rapture. He says, soon. My birthday is in December. It's coming soon. Don't you love it when they post a movie you've been waiting to see and they say, coming soon, 2023. <laughs> In my definition, that's not soon. Soon is not a place on a watch. Soon, soon is relevant and irrelevant both at the same time. When you say, when you go to a restaurant and they say it'll only be a few minutes, describe to me that few minutes you're talking about. Because I'm thinking you've already wasted enough time telling me it's coming. You should be going to get my food now. <laughs> you know, 30 minutes later, your food shows up and you, you think they lied. But they're thinking, oh, I got it to you as soon as I could. But you're thinking that wasn't soon enough. <laughs> so soon is a tricky word. But Jesus just says soon. You know why? Because that's the only word he knows. That's the only timing he knows. Jesus, when are you coming back? Soon. <laughs> that's the only way he knows how to describe it. Jesus, when are you coming back? Very soon. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. So he pushed the envelope a little bit, said very soon. But in the time of Noah, he said, he said, during that time, it will be exactly like what we're living now. People are eating, you're drinking, you're having parties, you're going out, you're, you're fellowshipping, you're having weddings and you know, all these, and life is just going on and you can live your life, but we need to know in the background of our mind and in our heart that there is going to come a soon at a suddenly. I want to tell you that that, look, we, we, we talk about, oh, a big revival. We talk about, oh, thousands and millions are coming to, to Jesus Christ. There will be no bigger revival than one second after a rapture. When people who hear a message like this and they go, man, that guy is crazy. And all of a sudden something like that happens. Guess what you're doing? You, you an instant believer. But the door was shut. Now, it doesn't mean there's, a, there's not, there's an, it doesn't mean that it's over. You can still get saved after the rapture. But, the, but there's a time after the rapture called the tribulation. And if you want to, if you want to tribulate, you go right ahead. Because in seven years, the Bible describes it. It's called the tribulation, but after three and a half years, the name changes to the great tribulation. And I don't know about you, but if you don't want to tribulate, you don't want a great tribulate. <laughs> I mean, let, let me, just, let me just, just clarify. You think you live rough now. You ain't seen nothing, nothing yet. You, you, can, you can watch from the game or you can watch from the sidelines. And you know what? When I was growing up playing sports, I hated sitting on the bench. Yes, there were times I sat on the bench. I'll be honest with you. But you know what? It's always different from inside the game. You know what? During that time, I want to be, I want to be standing on the sidelines. <laughs> I, want to be, I want to be seeing what's going on. I want to be praying for people. I, I don't know if that's what happens in, in the heavenly realm at that time. But you know what? I, I, want to, I want to live a life now that I believe that, that the flood is coming. I believe there is a Holy Ghost flood coming. And I believe God is releasing a message like this. So to be a wake up call and a seed planted in your heart so that you know that, that and you're not going to be able to walk out of here and forget this. There are some times I preach and I know, you know what? They said amen during the service, but they won't, they won't, they won't remember three things I probably said today. But you know what? I believe that seeds are always planted. 
And when the time is needed, the harvest is there. If you receive the seed of this word, you will not forget it. You're going to walk out of here and talk about this at lunch today. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever seen a, an end time movie? Anything? Come on. What, what was that movie? What, what movie did you see? Just left Behind. Okay. Yeah. Left Behind is a, is a good series. I, I, I've read all the books. I, and Robert, where's Robert? I saw him in here earlier. My, 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 my nephew, when he was little, I was reading Left Behind. He wanted to read it, but they had a kid's version. I read all those books too. Because it just, it was a great story, but it just fascinated me. And it's, it was one of those things that helped promote my study of the end times. Because I wanted to make sure if somebody's getting, reading that word, they're getting the right word. I want to I do this. I want to share with you. I want to share with you because, you know, I started off saying that spiritual things are weird. I want to I erase some of the weirdness for you. Y'all okay? I just want to, because if you read the word, sometimes we can read the word and overread something. Or read over something without catching what it said. A lot of the scriptures I'm going to share with you here for the next few minutes. You've read these stories before. Maybe you didn't catch the essence of what it was saying. Because I told you before, if an angel appears, first thing he says, don't be afraid. Because spiritual things really mess with your mind. God is not interested in your mind. He's interested in your faith. He wants when you read the stuff in the word, not to discount it. Oh, well, I don't see how that could happen. You know what? I don't see how a virgin birth can happen, but I believe it did. I don't, I don't, you'll never catch me arguing about that. If the Bible says that Mary was a virgin when she uh, had, uh, was, was uh, conce- conceived Jesus. I believe that. I'm not going to argue with it. I know there are things that are way above my pay grade. My job is not to question it. My job is to believe it. If it's in that word, I'm going to believe it. There are some things that have messed with my head, like a floating axe head. Come on, I mean, where'd where'd the axe head go in the water? Right there, into a moving river. Oh, let me do this. Let me throw a stick out there and watch it float. That messed with my head, but I I do not doubt it. So let me share these things. I'm going to give you seven accounts in the word of where things like the rapture have happened. I'm not calling these raptures, but some of them are called translations that where one person has moved from one place to that. Y'all okay? Y'all just receiving real good, right? Amen. Okay. Uh, Number one in the book of Genesis chapter five, verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot, begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God. What? Took him. Seize, snatch, carry away. So imagine, let me, let me just explain Enoch's life. There's actually, I don't recommend you read it. Because some things have been misplaced in it, the book of Enoch. And so I, I don't, re- that's why it's not part of the canonized Bible. But Enoch had a, can you imagine Enoch? Now he, he was alive during the time of Adam and Eve. Can you imagine running to, to Grandpa Adam's house and Grandma Eve's house? Grandma, Gra- tell me some things about God. Tell me about that garden again. And so he developed this, he was one of the only offsprings that developed this like relationship and desire to know God in such a, 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 a way that he just, everything he did, he craved the presence of God. And, and he was so close to God, he would chase God so much that one day God just said, you know, we're closer to my house than yours, just come home with me. Now think about this. The Bible does not re- only records two people who did not die, and Enoch is one of them. And that's very important to end time teaching, and, and maybe we'll talk about that in a future time. So Enoch is number one. He was just walking with God and then was not. Okay? Where is he today? You want me to tell you? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> like, I, like I said, there are some things above my pay grade. I mean, it, I'll have to study a little more to find out. Probably living, you know, somewhere as a, as a stockbroker or something, just waiting for... I don't know. Anyway, number two, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 11. This is, now th- this person is, is mentioned twice. Okay? Elijah. 1 Kings eighteen eleven says, and now you say, go tell your, this is uh, uh, Elijah when, uh, 
when the king was king ahab was trying to seek him out it was toward the end of a three-year drought uh, through the whole land of israel and uh, he uh, king ahab was uh, after him trying to find him trying to get an answer for him or kill him or whatever now listen to this so this one day and now you say go tell your master El- elijah's here and it shall come to pass as soon as i go this is the, the, his servant explaining to Elijah what he thinks is going to happen. Elijah said, go and tell your, your, your master Elijah is here. And he says, uh, as soon as I do that, um, the spirit of God, that, that the spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I tell, go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, I your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. So he, he found Ahab, I mean, he found Elijah. Elijah appeared to him toward the end of this. King Ahab is somewhere else looking for him. And he's, he, he's, he comes and says, hey, it's me, it's Elijah. He says, go tell your master I'm here. And, and he refused to do it. He said, look, I'm a believer. He said, I, I'm, I'm, I serve your God working for an ungodly king. He said, but I know what's going to happen. As soon as I leave, the spirit is going to take you to another place. So how did, think about this. This is thousands of years ago. Why would he say that? Because probably it had happened before. Why would that be his first response? Why didn't he just say, no, as soon as I tell him, you're going to run away. He said, no, no, the spirit is going to take you to another place. My mind goes and thinks, why would he say that particular thing if it had not happened before, if he had not seen that happen before? He said that. So the next one is Elijah again. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 11. This is at the end of his life. He's got Elisha as his understudy, as the one who's going to take over in the prophetic role of the nation. Verse 11 says, Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now I want you to understand Prophetically, there are two people in the Bible who do not die, who are a very part, big part of the end times, especially in the book of Revelation. They're called the two witnesses. It's two men who never died. And, and so we see the second person here who, who is recorded to never have died. It is Enoch and Elijah. Elijah, the Bible says, was carried up in a war when it doesn't say he died. As a matter of fact, the whole, the whole chapters leading up to this that talks about Elijah, uh, he said, your, your master is departing. Your master, people came to Elijah, to Elisha and said, your master is departing. Your, they never said he's going to die. They said he's departing. He's moving on. Where's he going? To heaven. He says, if you see, he's told Elisha, if you see what happens, then your request of a double portion anointing will be on you. And he saw the whole thing. He saw the chariots come down and the the whirlwind and the fire and all this. And he was taken up into heaven during this time. Y'all good? Y'all looking at me like, man, where where are you getting this from? So we see, yeah, thank you. Right out of the word. Amen. So we see Elijah. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. I'm not spending a whole lot of time on these because I want to get the the next few to you, okay? Just say I'm learning. learning. Okay. Matthew 27. Verses uh, 51 through 54. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn. And this is, of course, at the time of uh, Jesus' crucifixion. And I want you, this one, actually, this one is part of a really big study I do, a big message I do. We don't have time to do it today. Hopefully in, in the coming months we will. Matthew 27, verses 51 through 54. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked. And the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Okay, the bodies of who? Saints. Saints. And who had what? Fallen what? So he didn't call their passing death, he called it sleeping. Okay, Paul even, even says that. He said that the, the ones that were asleep raised, and coming out of the grave... After his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly. What did they do? They feared because spiritual things are weird sometimes. 
He said they feared truly this was the Son of God. So imagine this. Jesus had just died. In Ephesians chapter 4 said that when Jesus died, he went to the pit. He led captivity captive. Where were these people captive? They were held in a place called Abraham's bosom. It was everybody from, from Adam all the way to the last thief on the cross. And the Bible says that when Jesus went to hell, he preached who he was, and they resurrected at the time he set them free. Those who believed, no matter if it was divided, it was divided between people who did good and people who did bad. You can go and hear the story of Jesus talking with the, the rich man and Lazarus. He said the, 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 the man covered with sores. He was a good guy, but he was sick. He was over here with the good. And the, the bad guy was over here where it was a little warmer. There was a great chasm between them. And what did he say? Hey, have Lazarus put his finger in the water and touch my tongue? No. So this wasn't hell. This was a foretaste of what it was like. So when Jesus came to preach who he was, everybody on both sides of the cavern got to decide. And those that believed were right here in Matthew chapter 27. When Jesus set them free, they rose up out of the ground in their natural bodies. The Bible says that they were on the earth for 40 days. Walked on the earth for 40 days. Are y'all freaked out? I didn't hear a lot of answers, so. But what happened? This was not a rapture, but this is one of those things that, ha that, that has the same kind of connotation that they were raised up. Amen? All right, let me move on. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. This is the angels, and they're describing this first chapter about Jesus' ascension into heaven. And he said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Because what, what had happened right here? Jesus had gone up. And you think, well, this was Jesus. This doesn't count. Did Jesus return as a ghost or as a man? Was he spirit or was he in body? So him ascending up in a physical form is something we can add in this category. And he says this, in, he says in 111, he says, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He just described a lot of the end times right there. He said that you, you I mean, Jesus didn't just disappear. He just, because it says, why do you stand gazing up in heaven? I think they actually saw him like leave. And there it goes. I was like, oh my, oh my heart, slow down. <laughs> And they see him go up into heaven and these angels are like, okay, show's over, get to work. The same way you saw him leave. Y'all okay? Check the pulse of the person beside you. I'm just kidding. Okay. Let's look at two more and then we'll bring this to an end. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 verse 38. And this is Philip the Evangelist. Philip the Evangelist is, is, is one of the coolest people because his name is Philip number one. For those of you who don't know, that's my name. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. So Philip the Evangelist is one of, he, he gets born again. He's, he's, he knows Jesus. He, during the persecution and, and uh, by the Romans, he, he flees and he finds himself going through the city of Samaria and he gets stopped by the Holy Ghost to preach right there in Samaria. He preaches so powerfully that the, now Samaria was known as a, a very religious city, but their religion was witchcraft. And so when he, he preached there, the power of God showed up so mightily that it shut down every believer in witchcraft. The Bible actually says that they brought all the, the everything they use in occult practices and dark arts, and they put them in the middle of town, and they burn it all. They were done with that life. I mean, this was a mighty thing. I mean, Philip, Philip's got to be thinking in the back of his mind, yeah, that's what's up. You know, drop the mic, you know. But, but here's what I love about him. When he leaves the city... I'm sure in the back of his mind, he's thinking, what city now, Lord? What city now? Where do you want me to go? What big uh, metropolis do you want me to take your power to now? And he says, no, no, I want you to go stand next to that one chariot. You mean that, that chariot over there? Yeah. And he says, inside of that is a very influ influential man from another country. 
And he goes and he follows a chariot and he hears the man reading from the, a scroll. You got to think this man has to be wealthy because he had to buy a handwritten scroll and he happened to buy the one that Isaiah wrote. And he wrote, the, he was reading out loud the book of Isaiah and he got to the script, the prophetic scriptures of Jesus. And you got to think this is just a couple of months after, within a year after uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. And Philip says, hey, um, do you know what you're reading? He says, no, I don't, I don't know unless somebody explains it to me. He said, I know. Scoot over, let me ride with you. And he gets in the chariot with him and he, he preaches Jesus to this man so powerfully that the man says, look, I want to be baptized. And he tells his guys, pull over, pull over to the river right here. Why should I not be baptized right now? He said, he baptized until we went in the water. He, he said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and put him underwater. And when he brought the man up, Philip was gone. The Bible says that he was taken away. The Spirit moved him. Now, if you go and look the city he went to, it was some almost 20 miles away. He was in this one place, and the Spirit carried him into another city. And so I, I, what, the reason I'm explaining all these stories and, 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 and paraphrasing them in, in, in as much detail as I can with the time we have, because I want you to understand that when a rapture, when we speak of a rapture, it's not a far-fetched thing. Things like that have been happening the whole time. Oh, this is the last one I'm going to do. Re Revelation chapter 11. And this one's a prophetic word of the two men I just told you about. The two, wit what they call the two witnesses. The, in, in Revelation chapter 11, it explains the life of these two witnesses. There's a time coming after the rapture when an antichrist appears, two righteous men appear. And as he is, as the Antichrist is, is growing in popularity and, 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 and rising in whatever system he rises in, military, political, whatever, there are two, two witnesses that cannot be killed who are preaching against him. And they're trying to win people to Christ. And so you got to see this thing when it talks about these two witnesses that, that have never died. you got to think that it's got to be, got to be Enoch and it's got to be Elijah. Okay, and so they have the ability to call down curses. They have the ability to 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 stop people who try to hurt them and shoot them or kill them or whatever. And this is just toward the end of it. After three and a half years, the Antichrist himself has the power to bring these two lives men to an end. And he physically kills them himself. The Antichrist as a show of his power. Okay. And he, here's what he says. He says, now, after the three and a half days or years the breath of life from God, I'm sorry, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. Now this is, listen to this. They're dead, laying in the streets. The Bible actually says people are having parties and celebrating the death of these two righteous men. Because there's something that if you're living in sin, there's something you hate. It's the word of God. When you are living in sin and enjoying your sin and somebody's preaching the word of God, you don't want to hear that. That's like nails on the chalkboard to your, to your, your flesh. And so hearing a word of God that you don't want to hear and, and it brings such conviction out of such a heart of love and you, can't, you, you feel like you can't receive, I don't want to hear that. When the voice is stopped, these people celebrate. Praise God. We can, oh, they ain't going to say praise God. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. They're dead. The Bible says they exchange gifts. They make it a national holiday that these two men are dead. Can you imagine going to Hallmark? Here's your birthday, your anniversary section, your graduation section, your get well, and here's the two witnesses are dead section, you know? <laughs> here's my gift. Oh, let's, let's have a cake. I don't know if they have cake or not. You can see my mind needs some help. Okay. After three and a half days, the breath of, breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. Now, these, these bodies are left to rot in the street. People are dancing around them, celebrating their demise. In three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon those who saw them. Yeah, you think? <laughs> Two men come alive, five people drop dead. <laughs> and they heard a voice... A loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here, seize, snatch, carry away. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. Now, I want you to know that I, I feel the, just the, the unction of the Holy Ghost. Just, just to say this, that 
of all the things we could have studied today, I feel like this is the most relevant thing I could have brought you. Because there's people in here, you are, you're not stuck in indecision. You're not, you're not over here as a holy roller. The worst place to be is sitting on a fence. The Bible says be hot or cold. Don't be lukewarm. He, he, he says that lukewarmness is, is repulsive to him. It's, it's like those freaks who drink cold coffee. I just don't. I'm, I'm just kidding, y'all. Come on. Don't be throwing rocks at me, y'all. Come on. Coffee's made to be hot. The church said amen. <laughs> and I have a microphone, so. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. There's some iced coffee I like. Okay. But he, here's the thing. For those of you who are sitting on a, on, a, on a spiritual fence, I want you to understand this. The fence goes and is owned by the devil. Because a place of indecision is a decision. We have a technical term for 99% disobedience. You know what it's called? Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. We have a term for 99% obedience. It's called disobedience. Yes, Lord. That may have just been only one of those alarms that pastors could hear. It's like a high whistle for a dog. <laughs> If I start chasing cars, y'all know, okay? <laughs> but I want you to understand that, that and, and no decision is a major decision. And there's, there's only two choices. The middle is not a choice. It is not a third option. The middle is a decision to not follow Christ. Going to church, reading your Bible, putting money in an offering plate, and still not deciding to follow Christ is living for the devil. Listen to me. You can be very religious without Jesus. You can be a church attender without Jesus. You can be a Bible reader without Jesus. But you can't go to heaven without him. This, this is the message. And this is the time. This is the message and this is the time that Jesus Christ gave his life so that when we make a decision, the decision is easy to make. His decision was hard to make in the garden. God, take this cup from me. But if, if, even if you don't, I'll go, I'll do it. He wrestled with the decision so that we would not have to. You know what? I grew up in a time, and most of you did too, where we heard hellfire and brimstone. Anybody? Come on. That was the message. Hellfire and brimstone. More hellfire and brimstone than love. God, listen to me. I, this is just, as I've probably shared this before. God is not so interested in you not going to hell as he is interested in you not going to heaven. Listen to me. Yeah, the Bible says there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. But hell, you, you, got, you, you probably already have a picture of hell. What you don't have is a picture of heaven. Heaven is the place. And there's the only way to do it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, if you had to make one key, that is the key. Jesus is the only key to get into heaven. Jesus is all. There are no, there are no multiple paths to heaven. There, there are no other gods that can get you there. Jesus said, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I want to get everybody to stand up. This is, this is a crucial, crucial time. And we've had some fun. We've learned some stuff. But this is, this is the time. Y'all, I got saved at a... At a, a home pastor brown ron used to have a home group for teenagers back in the in 1980 something when i was something years old <laughs> and i remember pastor ron used to tell me all the time you need jesus you need jesus and i knew i need jesus what what stopped me from receiving jesus is she didn't know what the things i had done i let my past be a hindrance to my future 
I was holding on to my past so strong. Well, I was a juvenile delinquent, y'all. I spent time in jail as a teenager. And so I, that's what I held on to. That was the extent of my spiritual pursuit of God. Oh, well, you have crossed a line. And, and I felt, and that's what the devil told me. No, no, no. Jesus is for people like Amy. She's perfect. Never did anything wrong. First, her, her, first, her first words were tongues and interpretation. <laughs> My first word was biscuit. I mean, <laughs> tells you where I was at. Come on. <laughs> and, and, you know, I make light of all this stuff, but it is so real. And my wife can tell you this morning when we got up to pray together, I told her my dilemma. I had something totally different to bring. But I knew that I knew in my heart that it wasn't the message that really had to be brought as much as the invitation to receive Christ. Here's one thing you need to know about Jesus. He loves you no matter what. He loves every denomination of people. He loves, he created every color, every creed. I'm going to tell you, Amy and I got preached to, listen to this. A couple of years ago, we had an, we were, we went away for an anniversary to Atlanta. And we went to Cheesecake Factory. Mm. And we got ministered to by a cross dresser told us about Jesus. He was our waiter. I just wanted food. (laughs) But this guy wearing a woman's wig with painted fingernails and had the every effeminate quality told us about Jesus. He was still cross-dressing but born again. He had just recently got saved, but, you know, some of the habits were not totally gone. But he was a vessel that told us about Jesus. It was, it it blew my mind. I was just, I was in amazement. Look, come as you are. What relieves me and should relieve you? My job is not to change you. I always thought it was a minister. My job was to change people. We think the reason we seem so judgmental as a church because we think our job is to change people when they don't come in looking like and smelling like the church. Our job is to love people right where they are. Many years ago, I went to minister in, in, in L.A., and we went down to, I had a lot of the staff with me, and we went to, uh, to San Diego, to the Santa Monica Pier, Santa Monica Pier. And so it was midnight, and we bought, a, we bought like five dozen little hamburgers. And we had this evangelistic goal to win everybody to Jesus. Everybody, everybody. And so the guy who was leading the, the, uh, the, the ministry that day, he, sa- he said, you will encounter tonight everything that's not in the church I was like bring it he said you will encounter drunks bring them drug addicts bring them homosexuals whoa wait a minute whoa I'm from the south and it, I'm telling you that was my attitude and God said no 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 straighten it up right now and the first person I ministered to the only person I ministered to that to that night was a guy who came looking for food and he said I have just I didn't get enough money to buy food he said I had to turn tricks with another man to have the money I have to try to get something to eat at McDonald's this is graphic I know it is I I, semi-apologize but don't you understand what he had to do to get just a little money and you know what we do as a church? Well, brother, what led you down this dark road? Well, brother, you know you need Jesus. You know, and, and you know what? I just grabbed a few of those hamburgers and sat down at a table with him and just watched him eat. It, 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 it was more of my 
night of being born again than his. And I didn't talk to him about Jesus. I just talked to him about where he's from and what his name was and how we know we got brothers and sisters and stuff. And then when his stomach was full, he had an ear to hear what I had to say. And do you know, we, we took him home with us that night and put him in a program that he graduated from three months later. All because he didn't feel like he was judged. And, and it's just, every time I tell that story, I, I just like more and more realize how, how tough it must have been for Jesus to go to a cross when he knew more than we did what was really out there in the world. But just as he had Noah prepare a, make a boat for the saving of his community, God has prepared a heaven for the saving of his earth. I don't know when. I don't, I don't know if it's my, my lifetime. All I know that when I look at the clock of the word, it just says soon. But maybe we won't go, maybe he won't come get us before heaven calls. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll pass before he comes. Either way, the job is not to wait. The job is to be prepared. And so I've said all that to say that there's a cross there was a man willing to die on it for us. He did nothing wrong, the Bible says. The Bible says that every way he was tempted, that we are tempted like the way we were tempted. He was tempted in the same way, yet he said no to every one of them so that we could become born again. He was raised from the dead so we could be raised from the spiritual dead. He, was, he went into heaven to prepare a place for us. I just want to ask you right now, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, now is the time. I'm not going to ask for closing of eyes and bowing of heads. I want to tell you right now that now is the time to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'm just going to ask right now. I don't want hands to go up quickly. Don't think about it. Don't analyze it. Don't try to get data on it or anything else. If you need Jesus, just lift your hand right now. If you want to recommit to Jesus, lift your hand right now. If you just say, hey, I've been living too close to a fence. Come on, just raise your hands. One, one gentleman back here. Come on. I know there's others. Thank you so much. You feel like you've been sitting on a fence or maybe you just don't know Jesus at all. Maybe you, maybe you are sitting here today just for this one thing, this one time, and this is just to receive Jesus. I didn't say anything that would scare you. Hopefully I said something that increased your faith. For the two gentlemen that raised their hands and even three gentlemen that raised their hands and even for those who did not raise their hand, we're going to pray a prayer together as a family, as a family. Those of you who prayed this prayer before, you pray it with me again. I know you got something in the crock pot. It's okay. It'll, it'll be all right. Holy Ghost will turn the, the heat down for you. Because this is family business. General, sir, you raised your hand. These gentlemen that raised their hands. Everybody in this room is about to pray a prayer with you to show that they have been in your position. They prayed this prayer. And they're just, they're just agreeing with their new brothers. They're just agreeing with their new brothers. Today is adoption day. You're coming into a new family. You got a new father. Maybe, maybe you prayed this prayer before, but you felt compelled to raise that hand. So church, let's just pray this prayer together. Just say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse my heart. Make me white as snow. I believe your word that says Jesus died for me, but the Father raised him up so I could be raised up into new life. And today, my heart believes that this is the beginning of my eternal life, my new life, in Jesus' name. Father, come in my heart. Be my Lord, my Savior, my very best friend. Give me your spirit to dwell in my heart and teach me every day how to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want everybody to do this. I want you to lift your hands up to heaven. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. And I want you to hear what I'm saying. And I want you to receive this blessing for yourself. Heavenly Father, I declare that every person in this room is blessed exceedingly and abundantly. And they're going out and they're coming in. They're the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. 
And God, I just declare right now that they will never come behind in any good thing, Father. I declare right now that every word I spoke today, Father, would resound inside of them, Father, as truth. And Lord, I think it would make them more hungry for the word than they've ever been before. And Father, I thank you right now that your presence is not just something we have in church, but it's something they take out with them for the rest of the week. And I declare your presence on them and their family in safety and in health in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome day. Yet you have lost your power